Good morning. I'd certainly like to welcome each of you here this morning to our services at First Baptist. We welcome you in the name of Christ, and if you're visiting with us or online at home, we welcome you as well. Even though we might be down in numbers today, certainly the Spirit of God is in abundance with us as we gather in this place. I pray now that you set aside all those things as we gather in God's place to lift him up in praise and in worship. Come, let us worship. Please join me in the call to worship found on, in your worship God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. I will praise the Lord for as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God all my life long. Happy are those whose help is the God of Jacob, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and who The Lord sets prisoners free and lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord watches over the stranger and upholds the orphan and the widow. The Lord will reign forever. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. God of worship, Lord of life, we offer all that we are to you in worship this day. Where we are strong, Bless our strength. Where we are wounded, heal us. And where we are weary, revive and renew us. We bring to you all that we are, the strong and the weak, the light and the dark, the good and the evil, and trust in your accepting grace. Accept this our worship, O Lord, and be thou present in the midst of it. In Jesus' name. I invite you now to stand as we sing, Rejoice, the Lord is King. Please stand, singing all verses. Give thanks and sing and triumph. 
Hear the word of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Go now to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and live there, for I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he set out and went to Zarephath. When he came to the gate of the town, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel, so that I may drink. As she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. But she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of meal in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I am now gathering a couple of sticks so that I may go home and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, Do not be afraid. Go and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me, and afterwards make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, The jar of meal will not be emptied, and the jug of oil will not fail until the day that the Lord sends rain on the earth. She went and did as Elijah said, so that she as well as he and her household ate for many days. The jar of meal was not emptied, neither did the jug of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. May God add blessings to the reading of his holy word this morning, for this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thank you, God. with us um, from home this day, Sarah Clemen, Mike and Sandy Fennerfrock, Betty and Bill Long, Mike and Diane Goodwin, and Barbara Lytle, which I have to say that's Shane's great-grandmother, grandmother, our children's great-grandmother. She's watching this day too. Barbara, no, Brenda Markey, Michelle Medlin and her daughter Erin, and then all the way from Texas, Carl Ponstingle and Brenda Chapman. Deanna Heishman, and Margie Kitts. We're so glad that you all have joined us for worship this day. And now I'd like to invite our children to come down for our children's time. Can I sit in between you? Okay, all right, thank you. Well, good morning. How are you? Yes. 
you know what? We can't yet. We have to, I know, we have to wait until people make pledges and then we can, can pull one of those off. But hopefully next week we will be able to do that. Right? It'll be exciting when we can figure out what's underneath it. So we're counting on all the grown-ups to help us out. See all the grown-ups in here? <laughs> yeah, okay. Just, just not as many today, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, did you, did y'all listen to the story that Mr. Michael just read about the prophet Elijah? Did you hear that story? So let me tell you a little bit about that. So Elijah was going to go visit a widow. Do you know what a widow is? That's right. That's right. A widow is someone whose husband has died. So that back in and back in Jesus. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's right. Yeah. So she's a widow. Well, back in Jesus' day, widows. This is really sad, but widows often died of hunger. Do you know why? It's because they could not work to earn money for food. They were not allowed to work. So they had to rely upon other people to buy their, to give them money and to help them get food. So let me ask you a question. How do we get money to buy food? Job. You work for a job. That's right. And then the widows back then, they couldn't do that. So she was very upset because she didn't have much meal left, which is like, you know what flour is? You know, use it to make bread or cakes. So she just had a little tiny bit left. And then Elijah came to her and said, hey, will you make me something to eat? I'm really hungry. And he, she said, well, I can, but I only have just enough meal, just enough flour to make a cake, some bread for me and my son. And then, this is really sad, then she says, and then we're going to die because we have nothing else to eat. So Elijah then, with God's help, performed a miracle. And when the, the widow went to the jar of meal, there was more in it. And then when she went to the jug of oil, you have to mix oil with the bread, with the meal to make the bread, there was oil, and it would never run out. You see, she shared with Elijah what she had to make a little cake, and then she had enough, and she never ran out. So let me ask you a question. Do you think we have any hungry people in our community? We do have some hungry people. Um, that, that's why we have that, that food when we give our food to the people that need it. That's right. That's right. Thank you for talking about that. That's right. Four nights a week, miracles happen. We have enough food to give out to lots of people in our community. Between 50 and 65 people come and get a meal at night, and there's always enough for them. But you know what? It's not just our church. It takes lots of other people coming together. There's 14 different churches and groups that work together to provide food for our hungry people in our community. Because I think, and I think Jesus thinks, that no one should ever have to go hungry, should they? Yes, we were able to get out your bread. Thank you. Yes, so let me, let me tell you a little bit more about this. So we're raising money. We're going to raise money over the next three years so we can fix up our building, so we can continue to help people in our community and tell others about Jesus. So next week, hopefully we will have, have some pledges that come in, and then we can take off the little, post, little pieces of paper and see what's underneath it, okay? So... Oh, no, no, no. We're just going to take off all the pieces of paper off of the picture here. Oh. oh. So starting next week, we'll be able to do that. And y'all can help me do it, okay? Will you please pray with me? Let's talk to God. Dear God, thank you for loving us. Help us to love others. Help us to serve others. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, thank you. You can go back to your seats. I invite you now to stand as we sing.
sing our second hymn, number 243. Spirit of God, descend upon my heart. Number 243. Will you please pray with me? Loving God, you never leave us alone, nor fail to watch out for our well-being, restoring us and providing for us. Because you are faithful, we know that we can come to you and make our petitions known. So this day we, play, we pray for the global community. Enable us to serve those in need and, well, and work for peace. We pray for all who are cheated and abused. Help us to be advocates for the powerless that they might enact godly justice. And we pray for those who suffer, those who are on our hearts, and we now mention their names aloud. Lord, hear our prayers. 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 God, we ask that you make us agents of your restoration and your healing. And we pray this day for your creation. The beauty is just right outside our doors. So help us to be good stewards of your creation so that future generations will know the goodness of your gifts. God, we pray for our church and our church's leaders. May this church continue to be a living witness for you. And may our church be a place of redemption and hope for all who enter these doors. And may those who are watching this service from home feel connected to us in this physical place. May this church be a light of your hope, shining in the midst of suffering and despair. 
We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning you heard in our Old Testament scripture reading from Kings about Elijah and uh, his miracle that he performed. This morning, I profess I will not performing any miracles, but I will be singing about the days of Elijah by uh, Robin Mark. These are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. And though these are days of great trial, of famine and darkness and sore, so we are the voice in the desert crying, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Behold, He comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, lift your voice, it's a year of jubilee, and out of Zion Hill salvation comes. These are the days of Ezekiel, the dry bones becoming as flesh. And these are the days of your servant David, rebuilding a temple of praise. And these are the days of the harvest, the fields are as wide in your world. in your vineyard declaring the word of the Lord behold he comes riding on the clouds shining like the sun at the trumpet call lift your voice it's a year of jubilee and out of Zion Hill salvation comes There's no God like Jehovah, 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 there's no God like Jehovah. 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 Behold, He comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, lift your voice. It's a year of jubilee, and out of Zion Hill salvation comes. Behold, he, he comes riding on the clouds, shining like the sun at the trumpet call. So lift your voice, the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion Hill. Salvation comes. Lift your voice, the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion Hill, salvation comes.
I'm so glad to see all of you this day. So we, the video we just watched was of Mark 12. So I'm going to read those verses again for us. So Mark 12, verses 38 to 44. As he taught, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and to be greeted with respect in the marketplace and to have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at the banquets. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearance say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. And then Jesus sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. And then a poor widow came and she put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Please pray with me. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So do you remember the movie Jerry Maguire? Well, in a very funny scene from that 1996 movie, Jerry Maguire, who was played by Tom Cruise, associates with Rob Tidwell, who was played by Cuban Gooding, Cuba Gooding Jr. Um, and, and Jr., C Cuba Gooding Jr., I'm sorry, I'm having trouble saying that today. Anyway, that, his, his name in the movie was, was Rob Tidwell, and he was a sports star. And so in that scene, Tidwell has McGuire on the phone and starts yelling at him, saying, show me the money. And everyone in McGuire's office can hear him, and they all have these strange looks on his face. Can you imagine in the office next to yours someone yelling over and over again, show me the money, show me the money. Well, that quote becomes one of the most famous movie quotes of all his, in all of history. Tidwell, the character who said it, was looking for the biggest paycheck as a sports star that he could get. Show me the money. Well, today we have in the book of Mark a very familiar story. We find Jesus sitting in the temple, watching as people came forward and put their offerings in the treasury. But we hear Jesus criticize the religious leaders because they like recognition. And we hear Jesus criticize the wealthy who give a little bit out of their abundance. And then we see Jesus praising a widow who gives all that she has the wealthy gave out of their abundance, and the widow gave out of her scarcity, out of her poverty. The scribes are criticized by Jesus because they are seeking recognition in public settings and at banquets. In social settings, respected religious leaders would have, been consider, would have had considerable social capital. From a scribe's perspective, along with most others, they were worthy of recognition. But Jesus, he didn't think so. And didn't think his disciples or, her, or his followers that they needed high social standing or influence either. You see, discipleship in the book of Mark means foregoing glory and honor and instead taking up the suffering and the shame of the cross. Unlike the scribes who always wanted the best seats in the house, in the synagogue or in the banquet hall, the followers of Jesus must have a whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all mentality. So the widow becomes a stark contrast to the religious leaders, to the scribes. She is the opposite of them. They inhabit opposite ends of the social spectrum. 
Jesus identifies her as a poor widow. And then the scribes, they enjoy honor and status, and they continue to seek those things in their lives. But lacking those things, the widow, she devotes her whole self to God. She becomes a model for Jesus' disciples. Today, our society, you know, we value wealth and prestige and celebrity too. Once again, Jesus, though, is speaking out against his culture, but also against our culture. At first glance, this looks like a fantastic passage of scripture to read because we're in the middle of a capital campaign. We kicked off last week our campaign to raise $300,000 to repair our buildings. And this passage appears to be the perfect text for encouraging everyone to give. The treasury collection that Jesus was observing was there to underwrite the religious establishment. They were collecting money to fund the temple. But here's the problem with this passage of Scripture. Does Jesus point to the poor widow who gives her last two coins to the temple as a model for giving? Or does Jesus point to her because she is a tragic example of how religious institutions can suck the life out of people and take their money? The widow gives all she has to an institution that is going to be utterly destroyed in the coming years. The temple was a failing and corrupt institution. In the next chapter, if you keep reading in the book of Mark, Jesus declares, no stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. At the beginning of our passage, Jesus warns the scribes who are partly responsible for the operation of the temple Jesus warns them because they were devouring widows' houses. This religious apparatus has become perverted. Its operators lead privileged lives, but it no longer protects the widows, the poor, or the vulnerable. Instead, the religious institution institution is living off of the vulnerable. Jesus is pointing to the poor widow because she's a tragic figure that has been duped by the religious establishment. So this is not a great sermon to preach on a Sunday in the middle of a capital campaign for a church. What was I thinking? Maybe Jesus is saying that the days are numbered for religious institutions that exist only for their own well-being. Churches that only exist for themselves will see their end coming. The widow gave everything she had to an institution that did not deserve her sacrifice. Mark 11 says that the temple was not a house of prayer for all people. It had become a den of robbers worthy of destruction. The temple was supposed to be there to care for people, for the needs of the vulnerable, but instead it was taking advantage of them. So how is our church worthy of the gifts that have been given or will be given to us by the faithful? How are we doing caring for the vulnerable in our midst? Are we caring for the poor, the widow, the orphan? The widow in our story, we do not know if she was one of the ones who had her house devoured by the corrupt temple officials, but we know that she is down to her last coins. Her husband is dead and she has no voice in her culture. She has no income. She has nothing. She is totally vulnerable. And what does she do in the face of the danger, in the face of destruction? She puts her last coins in the treasury. She gives everything at her disposal to a soon-to-be defunct institution. Here is faith being practiced in a context that makes mockery of it. I think it would be like, say you took everything you owned and liquidated everything and took that money and bought a stock in a company you know that is going out of business. That's not very smart, is it? 
And she is giving to an institution that most likely has taken advantage of her, of her or her friends. How crazy is that? It would be like taking everything you own, liquidating it, buying some stock in a company that's going out of business, and it happens to be the company that just fired you. Totally crazy, right? But here is a woman who is in the midst of all things that are not right, chooses nonetheless to give and to be faithful to a vision of something that's bigger than what she can see now. And the same is true for us when we give to this church because we are not giving to a perfect institution. I am sure that every one of us in this room, those who are watching at home, could come up with a list of things that we don't like about our church. It could be me, it could be my sermons, it could be another church member that you don't like, or it could be our style of worship, or maybe you don't like our music, or maybe you don't like one of the decisions that our council or committees have made. The list can go on and on. We give to this church not because we are a perfect church, we give because we believe in the higher calling of this place. We give because we know that God can take our stumbling efforts at being faithful and create something beautiful from them. We give because we love God and God first loved us. Honestly, when I think about that widow, I think the best thing that could have happened to her was that someone should have intervened on her behalf, should have reached down into that treasury box and fished out those coins. They should have given back that money to her and maybe a little extra. That would have been justice. That would have been the right thing to do. That would have been fair. But that doesn't happen. Instead, Jesus says to his disciples, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance, but some out of, their, out of her poverty. But she, out of her poverty, she has put everything she had, all that she had to live on. So what does it mean to give your whole life for people who, for for all of your trouble, may not even notice what you did? And what does it mean to care about an institution, however human it is, that you stubbornly decide to not abandon it and instead dedicate yourself to a vision of what it can be at its best rather than at its worst? And what does it mean for you to come to church week after week month after month, year after year, with your school supplies for children who are poor or your toiletry items for, Spanish, for our Spanish-speaking friends? And what does it mean for you to give of your time to sign up to be on this committee or that council or this group or to be a deacon, all focused on caring for our church and our neighbors? I'm not sure what all of that means, except that I think when we do these things, when we serve God and serve others, we are helping to bring the kingdom of God here on earth. We are helping to bring the kingdom of God closer. The kingdom of God is a place where everyone has enough to eat, everyone has a place to live, everyone has access to health care for their bodies and their minds, and everyone has a warm and safe place to lay their heads at night. The kingdom of God is a place where everyone is valued as a child of God. The kingdom is, of God is a place where fear and worry are vanquished. The kingdom of God is a place where love, joy, peace, and hope reign. And the kingdom of God is where everyone knows that they are loved by God. So my friends, that's what we're called to do, to help bring about the kingdom of God here on earth. We are called as individuals, but we're also called as a church. 
And through the giving of our gifts to our financial campaign, our capital campaign, we can repair these buildings so we can continue to help bring about the kingdom of God here in Front Royal and beyond. Show me the money. Now, I don't think that that would be Jesus' favorite saying. Instead, I think he would say, show me your heart. Show me how much you love me. Show me how much you love your siblings, your brothers and sisters, your neighbors, your enemies. And show me by your actions your heart. May it be so in our lives. Amen. We have come to the time in our service where we can respond to the ways that God has been working in our lives. We could do that while we sing. We're going to sing hymn number 623, A Charge to Keep I Have. So I encourage you to think about the ways that you have been living as a Christian. And as we sing, I encourage you to recommit yourselves to following Jesus and helping to bring the kingdom of God here on earth. And I'll be waiting down front if anyone has a decision they'd like to make. So let's stand and sing hymn number 623. Please be seated. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, as we come at this time, this part of the service, Lord, it's been an opportunity to serve you. And Lord, it is now our continued opportunity to give back to this church. 
And give not as our abundance, but as a show of our love both to this church and to our community that your word would be spread throughout. Lord, as we give this day and have given before, we pray that you accept these, our gifts, as we present them to you today. For it's in the name of Christ we do pray. Amen. Thank you. Be seated for just a moment. Just a, a few reminders of things that are going on in the life of our church. But before I do that, let me um, also welcome Susan McIntyre, Janice and George Shanks, Anna Hayes, and, and Cheryl Terry. They're worshiping with us this day. We're glad y'all joined us. So next week will we'll be Pledge Sunday, so we will have a basket down front. We will encourage everyone to, to consider how they can make a pledge towards our capital campaign. Hopefully you received a letter in the mail this past week. If you did not, please see Kayla for that. Um, we will also have pledge cards available next Sunday in case you don't, in case you don't forget your, in case you forget yours, we'll have one here for you. Also wanted to let you know about our Spanish-speaking congregation friends, and I'm not going to say it in Spanish this week, but the Baptist Church of the Good Shepherd, um, who are meeting in our, the meeting in our fellowship hall. They are expanding their ministry um, here in Front Royal. So starting next week, they are going to be offering a Bible study on Monday nights in our old choir room across from the church office. And then they will begin to worship here in the sanctuary early on Sunday mornings. So they'll be in here before we, before we get here. So if you come before 10 o'clock, then you can learn some Spanish. So we're so excited about their ministry here in Front Royal and for the ways they're impacting our community for Christ. Also make sure you pay attention to the other announcements in the worship guide. We are continuing to collect toiletry items for that congregation. And then this is our last Sunday that we're taking up an offering for the BGAV. We'll have a different mission focus next week. So will you please stand now for a benediction? My friends, God has given you a wonderful gift. The gift of a kind and loving heart. But that gift is not for you to keep to yourself. So instead, it's to be given away. So as you leave this hour of worship, go looking for someone who needs to experience and Feel and see God's love for them. So go and be God's loving heart to those you meet. Go in peace. Amen. <laughs>